This scripture this morning comes from Mark 14, 43, and then 51 through 52, and then we'll jump to Mark 16, 1 through 8. Just as he was speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, appeared. With him was a crowd armed with swords and clubs sent from the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders. A young man, wearing nothing but a linen garment, was following Jesus. When they seized him, he fled naked, leaving his garment behind. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome bought spices so that they might go to anoint Jesus' body. Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb, and they asked each other, who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe, sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. Don't be alarmed, he said. You are looking for Jesus the Nazarene who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go. Tell his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. Trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. The word of God for the people of God. <laughs> Thank you, Chelsea. Um... Kind of some strange verses, right, uh, to read on this Easter Sunday, but, uh, but good ones. You know, like the disciple in that first passage, uh, don't you hate it when you have a wardrobe malfunction in a critical moment? Have you been there? Have you had that before? I, I think about, uh, I had a few things come to mind when I was thinking about this passage. Uh, first of all, I thought about George Bailey and Mary Bailey. If you remember the scene from the great movie, It's a Wonderful Life, when he's walking her home uh, after that evening at the dance, and he happens to step on her robe, and then, whoop, she walks right out of it, right? Uh-oh, you see her then jump immediately into the bushes to cover herself, and George, he's, uh, that's a good wardrobe malfunction for him, right? He's taking advantage of that, <laughs> I think to other wardrobe malfunctions, I think, you know, now, however many years later, I still wonder, was Janet Jackson, was that on purpose or not, right? Do we, that was the big debate. I still don't know if it's true or not. Uh, many of us maybe can understand what it's like to have one of those wardrobe malfunctions. I had a few in mind that Katie advised me not to share uh, from the pulpit. So I'm not going to, I'm going to take her advice. She's wiser and smarter than I am. But maybe I can talk about that later if you're interested or not. She's shaking her head no. Anyway, y'all know, maybe you know what that's like. <laughs> Pants ripping at a very uncomfortable time, anything like that. But it seems to me that the uh, that wardrobe malfunctions that we have, uh, like Janet Jackson or Mary Bailey or myself or others, uh, they were not alone, right? Because the Gospels tell us in some of the most critical moments of Jesus' life and those that were following him, another wardrobe malfunction happened. What in the world do we make of this strange detail of this young man fleeing the arrest of Jesus naked into the night? Right? If you're like me, I have read those verses for years and just kind of skipped over and been like, that's weird, right? And just kept on going. Uh, but it's interesting, as we look at this, as we look at this detail of this naked disciple, we see that for, for years, hundreds and hundreds of years, this has been a subject of much debate among scholars. I mean, who was this guy? They've speculated with all kinds of theories. Was this Lazarus? You know, maybe, maybe it was him, Jesus' friend that he resurrected uh, out of the grave, they brought back from life. Maybe it was him. Or maybe it was Joseph of Arimathea, the one uh, who provided the tomb for Jesus. Many people think it was Mark himself. Then maybe Mark was conveniently describing himself as a young man while, you know, omitting his name from a rather embarrassing moment, right? Can't you see Mark just going, you know, the one time I forget to wear underwear. The one time this happens. 
right? Maybe that's true. Maybe that is. I mean, I, I, could see, I could see Mark's friends, you know, sitting down with him and saying, Mark, we love this account of the Gospels. It's accurate. It's concise. It's to the point. But you know you got to include that story of you streaking through the Garden of Gethsemane, right? Like, that's critical. <laughs> Who is this guy? Who is this guy? Well, let's remember a couple things. Unlike me, as I read this story for years, just looking over it as, you know, just some random detail, I believe, and we believe here, that every word of Scripture uh, has been co-authored by some rather brilliant authors, right? The, the people that wrote the Bible were literary geniuses in their day and time. And not only that, but of course we know that the other author was the Holy Spirit of God. And so whenever we read anything in Scripture, we should pay extra close attention, especially if we don't uh, think it makes sense to us. Uh, and because of this, we, because of the Spirit's uh, co-authorship, we believe the Scriptures are authoritative for faith and life. And every detail is placed there on purpose. So this morning, I want to give you all another theory about what's going on in this passage. As we approach this scene, this garden scene where Jesus is arrested and taken away, I want us to go back first for a moment and remember the conversation that Jesus had when he started out his evening. Uh, because it's, the scriptures tell us that on the way to the garden, uh, that Jesus had a conversation with his disciples. And he tells them about what's going to happen. And the scriptures give us their response. Uh, Jesus says to them, You all will fall away, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep will be scattered. And so we have people like Peter say to Jesus, No way. Even if everyone else gives up, even if everyone else turns away from you, I'm all in, Jesus. I have been with you since the beginning. I will not leave. He goes on to say, Even if I have to die with you, I won't leave you. That's how far I'm willing to go. And Mark then tells us that little line there that says, and all the disciples said the same. They all said that. Jesus, we're not going anywhere. We're with you until the end. So as we look back at verse 51, the beginning of that story of that disciple, we're told that this certain young man was following Jesus. In other words, he was a disciple. He would have been included in, among all those that said, Jesus, we're not leaving. We're with you till the end. And yet, when the going gets tough, when the authorities show up, when, they, when you have that moment where, of decision where you're going to put yourself on the line for Jesus, what do we see happen? We see that he runs away just like everybody else. Abraham Kuravila writes, At one time these disciples had left all to follow him. But now, in the abandonment of even the shirt off this young man's back, Mark shows his readers that the disciples have left all to get away from Jesus. Mm. To get away from him. I think this is Mark's way of underlining for all of us the complete failure and shame that they are left with. That in this moment where God needed them most, in this moment where they are with Jesus in his greatest hour of need, in this moment where they had the, the boldest declarations, where they said to God, I, I promise you, this is what we'll do, they failed completely and totally. I think it's also a hyperlink or a callback to another garden scene, way back in the very beginning of the Bible, where in that story, two others did not trust God and went from a place of confidence and communion with God and one another to fleeing God's presence in shame and hiding from each other. And all that we have left in this scene is this linen cloth that was left at the scene of the crime. It's the only evidence. And to me, it's a symbol of the complete failure of the disciples in that moment. I don't know. Do any of y'all know, any, know anything about failure? Do, you, do any of y'all, like me, know anything about making grand declarations to God or to others? Lord, this is going to be the last time, I promise. Or, Lord, this is going to be the day. I'm going to get my act together today, finally. Do you know anything about shrinking back in the moment when God calls you to do something? In a moment when you know God wants you to be courageous and you just can't seem to muster it up. Who among us has ever run away in shame and then beaten ourselves up over again and again and again about it? 
who've had our greatest failures exposed and seen, if not by God, by others. The Bible teaches us, and look, I'll be honest, my own life teaches me that we have all fallen and failed in some way, shape, or form. Whether that be in what the Bible calls sin, the ways in which we live not as God would have us live, or in the ways in which we've tried to be faithful to God and to others and fallen short. We've failed to show courage in moments that required it. Or we've failed in our commitments to those that we love most. And try as we might to cover those things up by downplaying them or by blaming others or by blaming God. God, if you had just done more. Or by avoiding thinking about them or by justifying ourselves. Well, you know, at least I'm not as bad as those people. Or, you know, what I've done is, what I've done is wrong, but do you not see all these other things that I've done in my life? However we try to cover ourselves, to me in this moment, we see the disciples totally naked and exposed. And the reality is that our sins, our failures, our weaknesses, that our own turning away from God can't ever be totally covered up. We still wear those things. They're a part of our stories just like they're a part of the first disciple story. That's why you would think if you were going to start a new religion, if you are going to start a new movement, you might want to keep your moments of greatest failure out of the story, right? That doesn't exactly inspire a lot of confidence. And yet here it is. Here it is. And I think specifically that the reason why this young man is not named in the story is because we're all that young man. It could be any one of us. We are all the ones who have found ourselves at one point or another fleeing the sh- from the shame and the pain of our failures. We all walked in here wearing something. Sure, we got our nice suits on, we got our Easter vest on, we got all that. But all of us have walked in here wearing something. And yet, the story is not finished. Because this young man ran away from this scene, leaving Uh, leaving his symbol of failure behind, this linen cloth. Uh, It's mentioned twice in these two verses. Uh, And did you know, we're going to follow some breadcrumbs here in these next few moments. Did you know that the only other mention of a linen cloth in the scriptures, in in Mark's gospel, excuse me, uh, it's mentioned only one other time. And that one other time is in Mark chapter 15, verse 46, which I want to read. It said, I'm going to read 45 and 46. It says this. When Pilate learned from the centurion that Jesus was dead, he granted the body to Joseph. Then Joseph bought a linen cloth and taking down the body, wrapped it, wrapped it the body, in the linen cloth and laid it in a tomb that had been hewn out of a rock. That's the only other time that this linen cloth is mentioned in all of Mark. It's the only time that we see this symbol of failure. And yet the first linen cloth that was torn away from the disciple, that was left in that moment of despair and shame, we now see being wrapped around Jesus as he's buried in this tomb. The naked body of the disciple there ran away. Now that same linen cloth is covering the body of Jesus as he's being buried. In other words, what we see in these moments is that Jesus receives the garment of shame from this young man and he wears it as he's dead and buried. But that's not all. Because as we finally turn to Mark 16 and read Jesus' account of his resurrection there, I want us to notice something else. When the women show up early that morning to this empty tomb, ready to anoint the dead body of Jesus, they discover that the stone has been rolled away And as they enter into the tomb, who do they discover sitting there? Right? We are conditioned by reading our other gospel accounts to just automatically say, oh, there's angels there. There's angels there. Uh, And that's true, absolutely. But I want us to notice, what what does specifically the text say? It says that there was a young man sitting there in the tomb. And don't you know that this is the only other place that that young man, that term young man is used in Mark's gospel. Only there in the garden, and now right here sitting in Jesus' tomb. Mark, I think, is giving us some breadcrumbs to follow, or some dots to connect. 
Except this time, what is this young, mar- this young man wearing? Is he naked anymore? No. It says that he is wearing a white robe. So let's follow a few more crumbs. The only other time in Mark's gospel that, a, that white clothing is mentioned is in Mark chapter 9, verses 2 and 3. It says this, Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. And his clothes became dazzling white, such as no one on earth could brighten them. I don't think it's a stretch to say then that what we see taking place in Mark's gospel is nothing less than an exchange of clothes that's going on here. That Jesus' naked, shameful death on the cross, he has been wrapped now in death, placed in the tomb, wearing the very same thing that was torn away from the disciple in those moments of failure and shame. And yet in his resurrection, we see this same disciple wearing Jesus' garment of glory. A white robe that is so white, as it says, that no human hands, no hands on earth could ever make it so white. In other words, it's a garment so pure, so brilliant, so bright that, that it could only be done by God. And what we see in these moments is that this failed disciple is now made new and redefined by the resurrection. My friends, I again don't know what you walked in here wearing this morning. I don't know what's wrapped around your life, what shame you might carry with you, what what failures your life might be defined by, what relationships you have fallen short in, or what God's called you to that you walked away from. I don't know what burdens you carry with you that feel like dead weight. I don't know, but God does. And you and I don't have to cover up those things. We don't have to run from them. We don't have to avoid them. We don't have to be afraid or ashamed of them anymore. Because Jesus Christ, the Son of God, God himself, who came to be with us in those moments, he is the one that wears those things around him. He is the one that exchanged his garments of glory for our garments of shame. He's the one that has taken our sin and let it crucify him on the cross so that we would now be redefined by glory. That is your identity. That is the resurrection hope that we hang on to. And no matter what your life has been defined by, when you are in Christ Jesus, no matter what your life could be defined by, when you place your trust in Christ, when you go to his tomb bringing all of your shame, all of your failure, everything else that you want to bury, Jesus then wraps you in his love, grace, and mercy. And that's something that you can never take off. You can never take off. And this is the truth of resurrection that we celebrate on Easter and that we celebrate every single day of our lives. That is our identity. And so this morning, maybe you're like the women as they come away from uh, this moment and like the tomb. Maybe you're looking into this, this kind of empty space, looking for Jesus, and all you see is nothing. Because when the first women got to the tomb, they didn't see, in Mark's story, they didn't see a resurrected Jesus. They just had to take this man's word on faith. And this morning, Jesus is inviting us to take his word once again with faith. To dare to believe that the gospel message here is true. And it's not just about this disciple back then. It's about you. It's about your story that God wants to come in and make his story so that your life can be his. And what I love about the way Mark ends this gospel, as abruptly and as weirdly as we read it to be, when the witnesses flee the tomb in fear and silence, uh, this ending has been so Uh, uncomfortable for people ever since the very beginning that they actually added a few more endings on it in later centuries you can go back and read that those those endings because they thought we can't end this scene with them leaving in fear and amazement but I love how it ends I love how jarring and incomplete it is and I love it because when I go back and I read Mark chapter 1 verse 1 
it reads this. This is the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ. The beginning of the good news. Uh, in other words, I think Mark's not just talking about this is how I'm going to start out the story. I think that's true. But I think he's trying to tell us something else. As Kimberly Richter writes, she writes this. What if Mark's whole gospel is the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God? What if all 16 chapters are meant to be only the beginning? Then Mark's abrupt ending is not a mistake, but exactly right. Mark leaves us to continue and to complete this story. We, we too will need to get over our fears and find our voices. We continue the story when we share with others the good news of this man Jesus, whom we have discovered to be the Christ, the Son of God. We continue this story when we turn around, when we've had a change of heart and mind, and know ourselves to be forgiven and loved and included in the kingdom of God. We embody the truth of this story when we work for healing and wholeness and overturn legalisms that limit God's grace and mercy. The gospel is continued among us as we practice Jesus' inclusive love so that no one is treated as unclean, that no one is treated as an outcast or a sinner, but all are welcomed into discipleship and into the coming reign of God. And that is the good news of Jesus that began on that day so long ago. That is what we're about. And so may we too get over our fears and find our voices as we, as these brave women did, because we're all here today. They eventually found their voice and told somebody. May we continue to allow God to write the story of Jesus in us and through us as we turn uh, as we turn to him and find ourselves no longer wrapped in our shame and in our failures and instead find ourselves wrapped in his glory. Let's pray.